Welcome to Establish the Edge. I'm your host, Mike Leone, back for part four of the off-season projection special with Ben Gretsch. You can follow Ben at bengretsch.substack.com. You can follow my work over at Establish the Run. Make sure you give a like, a subscribe to both the Establish the Edge iTunes uh, podcast as well as the Establish the Run YouTube channel. And I did forget to mention, also, you can check out Ben's podcast on iTunes with Sean Siegel, Stealing Bananas. Uh, sponsored by Roto Biz. Ben, we had a really fun podcast last night doing the NFC West, and now we get into the absolutely loaded AFC West, which is another really fun division to talk about. There's just so much upside uh, with the quarterback play across this division in the passing game. So we'll start with Kansas City, as always. We'll kind of go in order of the DraftKings odds, KC. The leaders in the clubhouse at plus 175 to win the AFC West. Looking at our play calling stuff, you know, as tends to happen on these more stable teams, Ben and I are really, really close. Got Kansas City running above average amount of plays around 65 and a half. And we've got them about 64 and a half percent pass rate. Uh, so we're, we're really dialed in as far as the play calling for Kansas City. And I think that makes sense because. We've seen them consistently at the top of the NFL in pass rate over expectation the last few years, which gives us, you know, a bit more confidence in the overall pass rate than we might on, you know, another team that maybe just had a fluky one based on game script. It still never ceases to amaze me though, because every time I, I set like the play volume and stuff, like I'm, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be, this could go a lot of ways. This could be way off, and then every time it's like <laughs> right in line with what you're doing. We've been yeah really locked in on the play calling stuff this year. As far as the you know, Mahomes' stuff, my efficiency might be light. I only have him at 65% completion rate. Right? You have him a little bit higher. I think for me, uh, part of that is basically just subbing out Tyreek Hill and bringing in Juju's efficiency numbers aren't great with Ben. Sky Moore, as a rookie, it's kind of tough to project. And I might be a little bit conservative on the efficiency on some of those pass catchers. As far as what that actually means, Ben, I do still think Mahomes is top four fantasy quarterback and i think he's honestly this is the first time in a while where i actually feel like he's pretty draftable you can get some good stacks with him taking him sometimes in round five and i'm pretty in on the elite quarterbacks especially if you're playing in big tournaments uh if you get to that round five area where i feel like that, that top of the draft's just not quite as deep as it's been at wide receiver maybe the last couple of seasons yeah i'm with you i think uh becomes a, a clear spot to consider quarterback Mahomes I think is still like right now is still typically going off a of QB2 or QB3 sometimes Herbert's going ahead of him right and it's still a little bit pricey to me just because you can get Kyler and Lamar after him with their rushing upside and I think I prefer them but um I completely agree with you like in best ball you're drafting a ton of teams Mahomes is very draftable because you also have all the ways to stack him after you take him basically yeah instead of before you had to get Kelsey and Hill and then and then you try to hope Mahomes hit you know gets back to you yeah it was almost the first three rounds thing now it's like yeah. Kelsey two Mahomes five Sky Moore nine MVS ten like there's there's ways to get it done Juju six um let's go to running back though we do have uh, one of our big disagreements centered around Ronald Jones maybe I'm just spurned by Rojo from last year I've got CH with 158 carries to Rojo's 117. You have it flipped with CH at 128 carries and Rojo at 167. We're pretty close on the targets for CH. You have a little bit more for Rojo, which makes sense because he, you're projecting him just be on the field more frequently yeah. than I am. Not a ton, obviously. 20, 24 targets for me, 18 catches for Rojo for the whole year, even though you know almost 10 carries a game. And right now, I think collectively, these two are probably too expensive. So I've been okay with CH at ADP, not really ahead. And I've really just been out on Rojo. You've been, and looking at your stuff, I'm assuming it's it's more or less the opposite where you've been out on CH yep. uh, pretty hard and then fine with Rojo at ADP. I don't, I mean, I don't really mind taking ceh what i have in my notes here is you know he had 13.9 carries per this is not really like a team share percentage or anything more advanced it's just very raw but 39 car 13.9 carries per game as a rookie it was down to 11.9 per game last year 
I mean, I think that's sort of notable. I mean, I think he had some injury issues too, right? But and then they bring in Rojo, and I wrote, you know, I have Rojo's carries upside higher on account of that they brought him in, and that's what he is. You know, a lot of people can talk about how that you know not liking the things that Rojo brings in the passing game and everything else, but like the Chiefs aren't dumb and, and not aware of that or whatever. I mean, the, the book on Rojo is known. They brought him in. Uh, I feel like he's the guy that has the better shot to be the heavier runner. You know, he's a more he's a he's not a huge back, but he, I think he runs pretty physically and, and is you know the the second we, half grinder option in this in this backfield mix. We definitely have evidence that Ronald Jones is a very good pure rusher. Uh, we don't have that evidence with Ch. It's kind of a guessing game as far as what the coaching staff's going to do. I still think the incumbent is the leader in the clubhouse and you know, his ability, CH's ability to do multiple things just gives them a bit of a better look. I, I feel like Rojo a little bit more like a very rich man's, I don't know, Derek Gore yeah. from what we saw last year, maybe perhaps more than I see him as the lead dog. I have struggled to see the huge upside um, just because I don't think he'll ever be like super involved in the passing game. They do some weird things around the goal line. So this, it's definitely an interesting thing to parse. I actually have drafted the most McKinnon of the bunch. <laughs> I like yeah. Jarek at cost. He's sometimes, you know, it's ambiguous, like just taking the cheapest guy. But to me, you've got some history with the team. You know, we had that huge success in the playoffs. And you do have the passing game upside with McKinnon, where CH, CH is basically disappointed everywhere in the, in the ground game and in the air. Um, so I, I, I just like the McKinnon bet, you know, five rounds later than Rojo knowing I've got more, I think I might actually have more workhorse potential. Yeah, I like that. Um, I, I think the, the broad thing is this uncertainty is probably driving all the prices down a little bit. And it's clearly a backfield that we do want to target. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, Daryl Williams it's, during stretches was a great, you know, plug and play for the zero RB type teams last year in, you know, in redraft leagues or in, in best ball, right? Obviously he had some splash games. This is an offense that's going to generate some running back points. I do have CH with more points overall because of the receiving side. I can certainly see the upside for him. Uh, I agree with you that it's harder to see the upside for Rojo. Like I, I don't even have him at 10 fantasy points per game in PPR, even though I do have him close to 200 carries. And so that's, you know, a, a pretty important note on him. I'm bullish on him and I still don't have him as, you know, blowing away in in fantasy scoring. I think he's going to have to be really efficient as a rusher and really hit on TDs to hit some ceiling. I like your call on McKinnon, but that, it, that uh, you know, uncertainty is definitely driving down the collective price of all of them. And that's something that I think is something you want to take advantage of overall. Yeah. One thing I've looked at in best ball, I looked at handcuffing because generally I'm very anti handcuff and two things I found when writing that article one, like some of the handcuffing and best ball work like, okay. Where if you had guys that were just in different roles and, and you even were sort of surmising Ben the same thing, where if you get like the clear pass catching back and the clear kind of like grounder and gr grinder and, and goal line back that the distribution sort of smooth out over the course of the season, they kind of both meet their ADP. You're not totally contingent on an injury, but you do have that upside. If one of the guys misses a few weeks, so this situation reminds me of that a little bit. It's just hard with three guys. I wish there were only two, and it, it might have been kind of an interesting experiment with doing the handcuff in best ball. I don't like doing it in redraft just because I'm really trying to hit the, the pure home run. And the other thing I learned from that article was these ambiguous backfields is to just try not to be too overconfident. So uh, right now, I'm definitely a little bit overconfident in my anti-Rojo stance. So I'll probably try to mix him in a little bit, even if I have him, you know, lowest exposure of the three, just understanding, as you said, there's going to be RB points in this offense. Yeah. I like that receiver. Go. We got some, some interesting stuff too. Yeah. We're surprisingly pretty close at wide receiver. Uh, the biggest discrepancies off the top. I have 15 or 16 more targets for Juju Smith-Schuster. And again, background, if you didn't listen to the other pods, generally my target stuff runs a little milder. Ben's runs a little bit hotter. I'm projecting a little bit deeper in the depth chart and some of the more like systemic risk of guys just you know missing plays or games here and there. Uh, so it is notable if I have a guy that far ahead of Ben. Yeah. And the Juju conversation is tough. I've, I've had it with Pat a few times. And honestly, a lot of it comes down to feel. Like I don't have the greatest 
you know, data take here. My big take on Juju, really all these guys is, you know, when you get a switch from a bad QB or in a new situation and you go to Patrick Mahomes in a pass heavy offense, the ceiling's likely bigger than the market's going to realize because the market's going to feel the uncertainty. They're going to zone in maybe on the base case. I think the ceiling's quite huge. I, with Juju, I just feel really confident that he's going to like play and play. It's health. I guess I guess I should say health. Knock on wood with the health. But if he's healthy, I don't imagine a world where he's not running just a shitload of routes. And if he's running a ton of routes in this offense. I think even if his targets per route run isn't at the level maybe we'd like to see out of wide receiver one, he's going to rack up a good amount of targets. He's going to rack up a pretty high catch rate, and it's going to be tough for him to really you know, be bad in this offense, and there are some ways it goes really well because he's still just 25, and it's deeper in his history, but we at least have some history of yeah. him being a higher-end receiver. There's a couple good arguments on that. I, I noted in my notes that Juju, for my projection I wrote, has upside beyond this for sure. Um, mm -hmm. the bigger, like a, a few, like big picture things. We, we were really close on play volume. We maybe didn't emphasize this, but Kansas city has been at least by your numbers that you've given me, Leone, at least 7.7 .7 to the positive on pass rate over expected in each of the past four years, which is, I pull, you know, the, the length that I pull into my little team sheets for the, um, for my for my projections right so everything has been incredibly positive that's a huge number even being five percentage points huge. positive is really big even being two percentage points can be big a lot of them are just like plus or minus one you really do see how the uh the the expected pass rate can drive pass rate for a lot of these teams when you're looking at it from this way that not a lot of teams deviate by more than like plus or minus two you get to like five it's big kansas city's been seven plus every year four years in a row I'm projecting them for the most dropbacks of any of the teams that I've done so far. I haven't got to Tampa Bay yet. I think that's the only other one that might contend. Um, but that's number one that obviously works in Juju's favor and the whole offense's favor. The thing – oh, the, the number two is almost every receiver that's played with Mahomes. I, I do a depth-adjusted racer, use mm -hmm. um, that for my efficiency – almost every receiver Mahomes has played with has been really good at that. Hardman's been really good at that as much crap as we give him doesn't earn a ton of volume when he earns volume at the depths that he gets it. He's very efficient. Obviously Hill and Kelsey fit this bucket, but even like Byron Pringle every year he's played with him has been really good. Yeah. Demarcus Robinson's one that's been okay, but not amazing. But basically even these guys that are further down the depth chart, rotational players, Mahomes elevates them. It's very clear in these depth adjusted uh, efficiency metrics. So you got that working for you. What I think is like, tough or you know hard to figure out is or the counter argument i would say is i i don't think miko is going to go anywhere as like the main rotational receiver in this top four that actually has played in this offense and has a, a mahomes connection i think you got juju mvs sky and miko probably and, and you have that projected that way too the big difference, I think, in our distribution is just that I'm even harder on to Kelsey's target. Yeah, really, really, it's you have Kelsey for more target. The, the, my extra juju targets you have for Kelsey, and then we're actually really close on the other guys. Let me just give the target numbers. We're about 84 targets on Sky Moore, about 90 targets on MVS, about 67 targets on McCole Hardman. Uh, I've got 145 for Kelsey. You've got 157. So that's really the difference maker. And Forgive me if you if I'm repeating you because when you went on the P PROE spiel, I was also thinking that they might be in a you know more of a competitive division than in the past, which could yeah. mean like like what if what if their PROE plus the game script dictates throwing even more? Right. <laughs> just it's just and I, I'll I'll repeat that argument for every single team in this division because uh, it gets me excited. It's something that I probably over relied on as uh, an anecdotal point in in the favor of these teams in the AFC West. It's not. Infil, you know, infiltrating my pure numbers that much, but it's interesting. So it definitely, yes. I, I want to, I, I was, I was bouncing around to a bunch of things, but I do want to make a quick note on Kelsey. I've seen a few people reference his underlying data was a little bit down last year. His targets per out run were, was a little bit down in the regular season compared to past years. Did have a little bit of a stinger in the middle of the season. Uh, and in three playoff games, he averaged nine targets, 7.7 .7 receptions, 99.7 yards. He had 299 yards in three games. So basically a hundred yards receiving had three touchdowns. Very much look like the Kelsey of old. 
I'm not putting a lot of stock into those drop off, even though he's older. And I think there is risk here. Um, I think it was mostly that he was playing through a bit of an injury for a stretch in the early <laughs> middle part of the season. And because we saw him close so strong and be so good in the playoffs, especially I'm not really putting a ton of stock in like skill decline for him yet. And uh, that's part of the reason I'm so, so high on him. It's worth noting that the offense as a whole went through a patch where they struggled like relative to previous years a little bit more. So it's hard to, you know, not, I mean, and part, you know, it's a symbiotic thing. Like part of that's maybe Kelsey declining a little bit, but also Kelsey's numbers might be down if the offense just wasn't, you know, operating. Yeah. It's probably part of what led, it was probably what part of what led to the Tyree trade, right? It was the two deep shells and everything, right? That was the big thing that everyone was dropping back, taking away the deep shots. Mahomes a dot fell. He wasn't able to get his vertical on his passes. Their teams were making them move the ball slowly down the field. And now they have a whole kind of different offense where they're probably going to have more weapons, more options underneath, and be able to do that more. Uh, I think Kelsey can still dominate as the lead in that. But, that, I mean, again, I, I think Juju, I, Juju is sort of the big discrepancy here. And I haven't even mentioned him, but he's the guy I'm kind of working back around to. If Kelsey isn't a monster number one, there is room for Juju to be a really big piece alongside that. And then we go to Sky Moore MVS. We both have MVS with more base points than Sky Moore. I know in our ceiling stuff, I've got Sky Moore with a higher ceiling, though. Like, like I hate to dock MVS too much for playing alongside Devontae Adams, who's just going to eat a huge target share. But I just don't know if he's ever going to be like, what would you say his ceiling target share would be on the season? Like, can this guy be a 20 plus percent no. target share player? I don't think so. I mean, it's not like, yeah. He, yeah, he was playing with Devontae Adams, but he's playing with a good quarterback as well. His career high was five targets a game, you know, or is right now coming over to the Chiefs. That was last year. I mean, he was so in a low volume I'm, offense, but um, I'm with you, which means I have Sky Moore in our actual ranks ahead of MVS because there's more uncertainty, more upside, I think, on the high end for Sky Moore, where if he is really good, like maybe he can earn these, you know, these target share numbers that we, you know, don't think is possible for MVS. Even if MVS is good, I don't think he can earn them. It's just like kind of the role we're sort of yeah. expecting him to play. Yeah. I'm with you. I think we're probably a little bit away from the market on that, but I think we're in agreement on it for sure. Yeah. Uh, recently we've seen Sky more, I shouldn't even say like gradually over the last month or so, he's like come down a little bit and MVS has come up. A little bit so i was worried i was gonna get like any sky more um but now he's i think pretty draftable where he's going uh back to the kelsey st oh I, I guess we should talk about hardman uh i've drafted hardman in best ball I, my inclination is he's just gonna have basically the same role as last year with perhaps a bit more upside because there is some uncertainty which to me on this offense makes him draftable but he's not like I don't, I don't ever feel great about it when, when I pull the trigger. Usually it's in a stack. You can't feel great about drafting Michael Hardman. I mean, how many times have we been bid on that? But I'm with yeah. you. I've taken him a couple times. I have tried to think through, you know, where might I be wrong on him? I think the way that I've come to that is he used to have very, I mean, even though they lost Tyreek Hill, he used to have very limited competition for like number three in the passing game, right? It was Demarcus Robinson, it was Byron Pringle. Now he has more competition to be the fourth option than he ever mm -hmm. had to be the third option because they have Juju Sky and Val the Scantling. There are, I think, a lot more ways that he could basically wind up off the field. And so, I mean, that's that's maybe how that fails if it fails, but I'm with you. Like, I think he's just somebody that everyone is sick of drafting and talking about, but there's, there's still upside there. He's the one guy that's actually played in this offense. He came in as a 21-year-old rookie, still very young. Maybe it's just taken him a little bit longer to, to really pick up the NFL stuff, but – it's very possible part of the reason they were willing to move on from Tyreek is they think he's ready to take another step. So pure math wise, and you touched on Kelsey's like really big upside, especially if you're not too concerned about, you know, the, the quote unquote decline from him last year, just so many potential targets available. That's one thing Tyreek Hill took a little bit of a step forward last year in terms of his target share. And now you lose him. I mean, if Kelsey's a 25% target share guy, he's going to be, such an absolute monster. I just got him at the ninth pick in an FFPC pros versus Joe's, which is tight end premium. Our pure math has him as second in the tight end premium format. I don't think I'd take him second just because CMC and those top three receivers. But honestly, after that, I think he, he's like in the conversation 
um, just because the ceiling is really outrageous for tight end premium. Yeah, I, I mean, I have him. I, I think he should go sixth in every draft. I think the top five is pretty locked in. If you wanted to take Kelsey over or into the top five, I think you can certainly justify it. But I think in tight end premium, he's you know he's sixth. Let's go to the Chargers. So another one, just like absurdly similar projection. Uh, ben has 65.8 plays per game, which is clearly wrong as I have the more sophisticated <laughs> projection of 65.7. Uh, we ha I have a 63.8% called pass rate. Ben is 63%. So I'm pretty hyped on, uh, on the Chargers offense as a whole. When I took a second look at it, you know, they're going to be, they're not going to be insanely pass heavy. They're like, so we kind of talked about Arizona on the last podcast is Dallas with, you know, a little bit lower of a pass rate. The chargers are like Dallas with a higher pass rate. Like they're not, I don't think they're going to be KC level in terms of PROE, but the pace is going to be really good and they are going to be a positive PROE. And looking at it last year, the both pace numbers in terms of just raw plays per game, which they were at, my God, what were they at? They were at 66.4. They were at 72 years ago, but that was a different coaching staff. The play clock stuff that I've implemented had them in neutral situations, and I was pretty strict with the neutral situations. The sample size wasn't like huge, but I had them as the second fastest to snap the ball uh, in the NFL. So I'm pretty bullish. They, of course, go to a positive 3.8% PROE after being negative PROE the year before and just Staley seems out of all the coaches in the NFL, Ben, he seems most committed to really playing optimally and just not caring about any potential yeah. blowback being sharp. And I think in the, you, you just talked about the case. It's, it's going to be the theme of this episode, but uh, in this division, I, I think he knows he has to, right. He has to play optimally to contend with Casey and Denver and, and the, the arms race in the AFC West. They're not going to win this division like being more run heavy. So uh, I'm with you. I think you got to be really bullish on this. So we each have Herbert right around 365 fantasy points in standard league scoring. Uh, so extremely similar there. Uh, her I think too, like there's also like some hidden value and this team's going to go for two more frequently than others and where they go for fourth downs. Like we, we could eke out extra touchdowns at the expense of field goals. Okay. But on, on Herbert, I, I come in a little hotter. I think on some of the other QBs, I came out lower on Herbert than I thought I would. I'm very optimistic. Mm -hmm. I thought I was pretty bullish on their pass rate on some of the efficiency stuff. And yet he came out lower than, you know, he came out as my like QB seven and he's going, you know, top three in a lot of drafts. I think he's a very clear breakout candidate as a passer. Doesn't have a ton of rushing upside. Did you notice anything like that or where are you at on? Um, I know when I QB first seven? did our projections, we had Herbert more like QB seven and I, you know, when we looked okay. in closer, but for us, the play calling had fixed that more because we have a similar projection. So it's kind of more that you're probably hotter on a couple other guys. I mean, sure. we want to, I'm assuming you have Trey Lance ahead of him um, with the, the big Trey Lance rushing Just projection. Points, yeah. Um, I think the, the, I think it's like a floor ceiling combination for him, for me. Like, I just think there's like almost no way this goes bad. And I do have him with a touch more rushing upside. I think by the goal line, um, in particular, he could score uh, a decent amount of touchdowns rushing the way that they use him. He scored eight in the last two seasons, which is an average yeah. of four, which isn't huge. But their scoring expectation this year is just pretty high overall. And it seemed like he ran a little bit more towards the end of last season. But that's like nitpicking. I think it's more like aggression on other guys than it is your your Herbert projection is. Yeah, I do have so I, I have a, a TD check for offenses. I have them again. I haven't done Tampa Bay yet. I also haven't done Green Bay yet, who are two other teams that will project high. But I have them right now, the Chargers, as my third most uh, of all teams are projected to projected for the third most total touchdowns behind only Kansas City and Buffalo. So I do have like a lot of TDs in the offense, and I've regressed Austin Eckler's rushing TDs quite a bit. I, it's probably that I'm too hot in other spots. And also when I switched over to six point per passing touchdowns, he did like jump ahead of Lance. So it's, it's, it's really tight in there in my final output, but I, I don't know. I just thought he would come out higher, I guess. The market is definitely super bullish on him. Like 
they have him QB two. We have him still QB three, and I think I think him and Mahomes are really close. I kind of have them as a toss up for three four. Uh, actually, have Lamar ahead of those guys, but we could talk about that when we get to Baltimore. Um, then I think Hurts and and the Kyler is an interesting one too. Like I think that's probably a tier though, right? Like Herbert, Mahomes, Kyler. Like I think. That I makes know. sense. Yeah, I, I have Lamar higher than them. Um, my Lamar projection is higher than Kyler, but I, I'm probably going to rank Mine too. Kyler 2-3 because I just I love the rushing. Yeah, Kyler's great. I think the, these three are all close. Kyler's one I, I, I probably I, – Kyler and Lamar are the ones I've been drafting the most based on ADP yeah. uh, of that bunch. Um, and we did we did the NFC East. We talked about Hurts' upside. Uh, as far as running backs go, I know we're – at ETR, I had a market on Austin Eckler. Um, actually, it looks like we're kind of right in line with the market. Have him as the running back three overall, but do think he belongs behind, you know, obviously the two running backs ahead of him, but also the clear top three receivers in Cup, Jefferson Chase. The big thing to talk about running back is Isaiah Spiller, both in terms of how much of a threat is he to Austin Eckler and how much value does Spiller have as a pick um, really in, in any format? I think you got to like Spiller in most formats. I mean, I think part of the reason Eckler, I mean, certainly when you look at Eckler's breakout last year, it was the rushing TD. He ends up with 20 total touchdowns, but the what he gained as uh, a goal line back was huge. And that wasn't necessarily, it was evident from week one, he got some, some, some close touches right away, but it wasn't necessarily the, the extent of it clear all throughout because they were trying to use Joshua Kelly in there. Some trying to use Roundtree in there. Some these guys just couldn't punch the ball in. Like they, I think it was very clear that Eckler was better than those guys at that particular part of of the job, right? But they've talked about easing Eckler off a little. If he, if if they do go back to something they've done in the past, certainly having sort of a bigger back take some of those goal line touches. I mean, that, that would justify or sort of explain the Spiller pick. Spiller fell a little bit because he didn't really crush the combine or actually was, you know, less impressive at the combine than expected. Yeah, and sorry to cut you off, but you, I mean, you're more into the prospects than me. Wasn't he pre-combine yeah. among, like, the top running back prospects? Yeah, it was like Brees Hall and Spiller has a little bit more receiving than Kenneth Walker. It was it was Spiller and Kenneth Walker as the 2-3 for, for a lot of people, the more, like, analytical people that I – you know, talk with more frequently. I think for most, it was a, it was a big three. It was Brees Hall. And then a lot of people, I think, have preferred Spiller to Kenneth Walker because he has more of the receiving and sort of three down profile pre combine. Right. And then he, he had the worst combine Walker really did well at the combine and then it kind of solidified into a top two and Spiller was falling back, but his production numbers from a peer, you know, the, 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 um, like the dominator rating, running back dominating stuff, how much he was doing in the offense is all very, was all very positive and, and both on the rushing and receiving side. And it's also interesting because Eckler, like, so last year, Justin Jackson, I was, I was thinking of it as like two different running back roles, Justin Jackson being the backup to the receiving stuff and the Eckler stuff. We did see that late in the year. Levitian obviously remembers that. Banked uh, in the one game when we got uh, Justin Jackson in the full Eckler role. Um the, the Justin Jackson's Jackson Rex anymore. Burke had heavyweight yes. matchup. That was amazing. Uh, he Jackson's not there anymore, so Eckler might lose some of the rushing stuff. I think his receiving was going to be solidified anyways, but is like even more solidified than ever. But if he goes down, I do think there's an interesting argument that Spiller could actually get a three down workload. It consolidate in a way that, I mean, that was Justin Jackson basically last. I know week. we had Dwayne McFarland on the Established Run podcast and. By all the PFF metrics, you know, Kelly, Roundtree have been really, really bad, uh, which supports your take that Spiller would have that Justin Jackson type upside that we saw at the, at the end of the last season when Eckler was out. So I do think with a guy like Spiller, you want to be somewhat cognizant of your format where in redraft, you know, I'm just looking at our ranks. Like sometimes we're a little bit higher on the guys with pass catching floors. And that makes sense for best ball where if you're only taking like five or six running backs, like you might, and you can't churn the waivers, like you might need some guys there and get you usable weeks. If I'm going for the ceiling in a redraft league, I'm not taking Michael Carter over Isaiah Spiller 
in, in, in any way, shape or form. Um, not, not to like pin down those two players specifically too much, but just understanding the risk reward nature and, you know, the contingent upside Spiller has is really yeah. quite huge. And someone like Carter is like, he does have some contingent upside, but Spiller's is just massive because of the nature of this offense and, you know, the potential that he's an undervalued prospect just because of the bad combine. Yeah. Well said receiver this is an old that gets me in trouble I mentioned i'm in an ffpc pros versus <laughs> joe's i just drafted keenan allen at 3.9 and i keep breaking ties in favors of other players at like the early third round at 3.9 in full ppr i had to do it one of the most discussed players in the etr projection slack because i think all of us i think we go through this cycle once a week where we're like i don't think you know, a 30 year old receiver who's declined in yards per out run should be ranked this high. And then we check the projection and it seems like we're being really fair, even it's, somewhat conservative on it. And yeah, that's the cycle. It's um, so hard to parse his individual situation and underlying metrics with what you have to think about the chargers. I mean, the last time we saw the Chargers, Justin Herbert was playing like probably one of the best quarterback games of the year last year in week 17 against the Raiders. All the fourth down conversions, he looked incredible. There's a big reason people think this is the Justin Herbert season. If he is that good and, and they pass as much as we talked about, like who else is, gonna, is you know what I mean? Like Mike, Mike Williams is here. They got some other guys that we're going to talk about, but Keenan Allen has plenty of room to continue to just be – sort of pulled along late in his career by his quarterback, yeah. which isn't the way it's always been because he's been so good at earning volume. My issue with him is he's like, guys like him are not providing a ton sort of after earning the target. He needs the really high targets per out run stuff. That started to fall off. That's part of the reason yeah. the yards per out run have fallen off. His yards per target have also been down the last couple of years from like the peak where, you know, maybe he was converting. Yeah, um, he, he was... 8-8 eight, eight in 2017, 8-8 eight, eight in 2018, 8-0 in 2019, and then 6-7 in 2020 and 7-2 last year at yards per target. Right. So you got this multi-year, maybe concerning trend for a guy who was never particularly an ath you know, athletic player. He wins on the great route running, and he's an incredible route runner. But as he starts to age, okay, you can't do a lot after earning the target now. Your yak is maybe falling off and those elements. And then also we're seeing a little bit of targets per out run decline. To me, that's really concerning for, for his, his you know, receiver type. At the very beginning of the offseason, I did a targets per out run sort of breakdown recap of last year. I reread it recently. And my note was he's going in the third round in the early offseason. I think with this profile, I would be more comfortable taking him in the fifth. We're not getting that discount. He used, it, he used to go in the third oh, two, three it. years ago. Well, so my thought was he used to always go in the third like in his peak. Right. Yeah. He's never really like a second round pick. He's still going in the third. We've started to see some of these skills decline. I feel like we should be getting a little bit of a discount, but that's offset by what you said about the offense. And, and yeah. And also, we it seems like we get less kind of these really high end wide receiver target earners, like to, to his extent, yeah. which in the third round. So, yeah, his tar. I mean, if you just look at target totals year in, year out, 159, 136, 149, 147, 157. It's man, it's tough though, because. I don't know. I don't know what the break even point is, honestly, in which you just say the offense and the targets are enough for me to take them, even though the player doesn't feel like the type of bet you want to make because yep. it's it's and a pure volume bet. To I, clarify I, that that fifth round thing, I, I was I mean that was just like early off season sort of yeah where guys go, but the fifth round is weaker at this point than I kind of realized it was going to be. I would not be waiting that long to take Keenan Allen if for some reason he did start to slip. I think he's a great I think you fourth can, round pick. Yeah, I think you can pass on him early three. When you start to get close to that three, four turn, yep. he's pretty good. I wouldn't be shocked if he scored, you know, set a career high in touchdowns, though, just because of the nature of the offense. Um, I know that's something he hasn't really done before. So it's not like huge in his upside, but that's something that wouldn't, you know, totally surprise yeah. me. Mike Williams now is more exciting, you know, as a bet. He has much more upside. He did match Keenan Allen targets for a stretch last year. And it was like, holy shit, Mike Williams is a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. And then it reverted back to Keenan Allen, 25% of the targets, Mike Williams, you know, 20%, which is a meaningful uh, enough gap. 
Silva's got them ranked back to back in his top 150. Actually, as, Sil- as Williams one spot ahead of Keenan Allen. I love that. I think, um, I think they're really close. I'd probably be super boring and cop out and say I'd take Keenan Allen in full PPR and maybe Mike in half PPR, but <laughs> um, they're they're I, very close. I think they should basically be back to back. Williams isn't like a traditional breakout player. It's his fifth season or uh, sixth season now, right? Um, the first four. He was right between 16% and 17% targets per out run every year. It was like, you know, do something. That's sort of this middling range. With his high A dot, it was okay. And his, you know, strong touchdown rates at times, it was okay. But it was like, you know, do something, break out. He got all the way up to 21% last year, which was really impressive jump for a fifth year guy and still has that vertical A dot element, right? Has mm-hmm. everything going for him that we just talked about with the offense for Keenan Allen is more like, in his prime, maybe not entering his prime, but in his prime than than Keenan, who's probably exiting his prime. So I like going Williams over Keenan as sort of the bigger upside play. If this offense really does smash, I think Mike Williams is having a really great year. Probably Keenan is too. They should be right in the same range, but I think Williams is the one that could really ascend to to a sort of new new level this year. Yeah, if they were to both have the same amount of targets, Mike Williams is probably waxing Keenan. Right. We've been high on Josh Palmer all offseason. There was definitely some good news today that Palmer is the leader in the clubhouse for the number three over Jalen Guyton. Uh, he's, I, I like him because I think this team throws enough to support kind of him having some, some value in best ball here and there. Just... If, if he is the number three, just via the nature of the offense and then the contingent value, you know, he had a pretty good game that Justin Jackson week was also a Joshua Palmer week. He got there kind of late, but he had a pretty good game. Um, now it's his second year for a guy that was pretty raw. I'm pretty into Josh Palmer as a late round receiver. Uh, any thoughts on like Palmer Guyton or the back end of this receiver corps? Yeah, I have a note that says Palmer's probably better than I want to admit. I don't, have him projected as well as you do. I've never really been in on him since his, he was a prospect, but there's definitely room for someone else. It's not Guyton. Guyton is the classic wind sprinter. The other guy that I have a note on, this will be fun. Uh, Cause this is going to be one of those guys you're going to shut down immediately. Like our, our last episode, I can't remember who it was, but they got, they brought in Deandre Carter. <laughs> oh yeah. Get out of here. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I think the absurd, super deep sleeper, potential option um just like he was decent with washington he has like very small samples of receivers He's mostly been a special teams guy but has actually been sort of okay as a receiver i want to look this is a passing game where i want to look at the deep sleepers because there's probably potential for somebody to ascend to a number three type passing role the other one is gerald everett we should get to but i think he's a really nice late round tight end as well yeah, I'll give you some leeway on DeAndre Carter because of your success with Kez Watkins last year. <laughs> uh, so you've earned some leeway. Gerald Everett, yeah, I think I might be low on him. I know Adam's been telling me he thinks it's low. Like Jared Cook was earning a pretty decent target share despite being pretty bad in this offense. And Gerald Everett, like, I don't know, he could be decent. You know, it's definitely more juice there than we had with Jared Cook last year. So. Uh, you have him for 80 targets and I have 72 targets. So I'm lagging behind a little bit. And also I might be lagging behind on the efficiency if we think um, it improves moving from the Rams to the the Chargers here. Well, the Seahawks to the Chargers. Right? Or the Seahawks to the Chargers. I skipped a year. I skipped yeah, a Gerald Everett year. We had, the, we had the, the cup of coffee in Seattle. Yeah, I mean, I uh, he's got the athleticism. Somebody's got to do something in this Chargers receiving core especially if some of the stuff I talked about with Keenan Allen does become more of a concern and he's kind of like lost a little bit of a step. Uh, I think that Mm -hmm. would be huge for Mike Williams. It would also have to be, I think, very positive news for Gerald Everett. His price is really palatable. If you miss on, you know, the elite tight ends, I, I, we talked on the last episodes, I'm not really into like the tight end six to 10 range. I'm happy to grab like an Everett in the like tight end 11, 12, 13 range, wherever he's going. Yeah. Um, He's going tight end 17. We've got him a bit behind ADP, but it's, I mean, the tight ends really all are clustered pretty tightly um, once you get to like tight end 13 or so. Yeah. 
it's just a good offense, right? Why not grab the tight end in a good offense? One mm -hmm. of the things we see with tight end break, like not breakout seasons, but like surprisingly good seasons is just like the spike in touchdown rate. Like Robert Tunyon two years ago comes to mind. He had like 50 something catches, not a ton, but he had like a 10 TD season in the Packers offense. You think he was like tight end five, even in, in PPR. You could see Gerald Everett with his athleticism having an eight to 10 touchdown season in this offense. Okay, let's go over to Denver, new coach, new quarterback, and yet we're pretty close on play calling. Uh, ben has them as pass happier than I do, so we have a little bit of a difference. We have them both running a little bit under league average amount of plays. I have a 60% pass rate. Uh, ben, you have a 62% pass rate. Uh, there, I mean, whenever we get fresh coaching and fresh quarterback, especially all in one, it can be you know, there's, there's definitely a lot more volatility in the way things can go. Yep. I'm just buying, I mean, it's a, a gut feel like you, you said on, a, on an earlier team. I'm just sort of buying that they're going to let Russ, cook, let Russ cook a little bit. That's been such a widely discussed narrative, uh, you know, after the trade, bringing in a quarterback focused head coach, Nathaniel Hackett. Um, I'm just sort of buying that they're going to be a little bit pass, pass heavier than Russ has ever had. Yeah, uh, I might bump ours a little bit. I think initially earlier in the offseason, we had it higher and then we were kind of unsure. Um, I'm probably going to bump it a little bit. So uh, score one, score one for Gretch. <laughs> uh, my, my as far as Russ goes, <laughs> as far as Russ goes, I don't know. He's, he's tough for me to judge. I don't know how, like, how much do you think he runs is... We have them for very similar rushing, which is yeah. not a ton. Uh, yeah. The big thing that I struggled with because I am having him throw a little more than he ever has is that, you know, at, all throughout Russ's career, he hasn't thrown a ton, but he's always had really high efficiency as a passer. One of the reasons I think that happens is just because of how he plays quarterback. Like I, I don't necessarily want to regress his pass catching efficiency because he plays quarterback in a way where he extends plays. He takes sacks at a really high rate. I do have a sack rate high, right? But also when he extends plays and gets a pass off and, and creates an opportunity, what he's doing is giving, how many times do we see Tyler Lockett then extend the play and catch a pass downfield? He's giving his guys a lot of time to then find open space. And so it kind of makes sense that a higher percentage of the balls he actually lets out of his hand go for, you know, big plays. And, and then there's a lot of efficiency on the receiver and tight end side, um, particularly with the sack rate. And then, you know, a decent scramble rate. Uh, he's not going to run a ton, but he is going to scramble some. And I just, I don't know if they do throw a lot more, how much that efficiency can carry over, but I do have all of the, the pass catchers fairly efficient in this offense. Yeah. I might be short on touchdowns. That's the biggest thing that spot, you know, sticks out to me is you have them for six more passing touchdowns than I do. Otherwise, we're like fairly close. You have more attempts. Again, going back to the pass rate, which I'm going to raise, um, which leads to more yards, a little bit higher completion percentage. But I'm going to look at the TD rate stuff. Uh, as you said, it's like difficult to figure out, not just because Russ hasn't thrown this much before, but then you're also using you know receiver baselines from guys who have played with shitty quarterbacks, and you don't know how much to pull those up. And ours is yeah. kind of like a loop to an extent. Like we're using Russ's, but we're not. You know, we're still using the baselines from the receivers historically. So um, that's what plays into it. Ultimately, I've got Russell. We've got him like QB 10-ish. I have a tough time taking him ahead of Brady and Dak. Like I like Brady and Dak more. And I think it's I think it's like the same tier, but I like Brady and Dak more. I like Russ more, I think. But I think you're right. I think that's, that's where it, it all makes sense. They, those guys all fit together in a tier. Mm-hmm. Running back. Now, no surprise here. I've got Melvin Gordon for more work than uh, Ben does. And Ben has Javante Williams for more work than I do, uh, which, you know, in some ways that's a meaningful conversation. And in some ways it's moot because we just want to look at the upside of the players. I found them. Th this was actually a running back pairing in that handcuff thing that I looked at last year where this running back pairing last season was really profitable if you just took the two of them. I think to start this season, I don't think Malvin Gordon's going to go away as much as we want him to. He was legitimately good last year yep. as a ball carrier. I think he had a higher yards per carry, higher yards per target than Javante Williams. He was really uh, good. Yeah. But Javante Williams obviously was you know, arguably the best running back as a prospect in his draft class. 
uh, it was pretty close. People were between him, Etienne, and Najee Harris. I know PFF, we had Mike Renner on the show, and he liked Javante the most, and he did really well in some of the broken tackle metrics that PFF uses from college. So really good prospect. We saw the monster upside, the game that Melvin Gordon missed. We bet unders on Javante Williams, and we got spurned by Javante Williams. He just just that nuclear game. Uh, the tough part has been, is he... You know, is he a round two guy or is he a round three guy? Because he's been juiced up quite a bit in the draft I, rooms. I like him in, into early in the offseason when it wasn't clear if Gordon would be back. But even before the rush trade, I mean, I think people were factoring in Denver was likely to, to go after a quarterback. But people were talking about Javante as a top five overall pick. Sometimes we, you know, we have a long offseason. We forget some of that. I do think that's sort of notable. And, and I think in the early drafts, he was going late round one. Um, the, the stuff on their split, I, 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 Gordon was really good. And I think there's definitely a possibility. It's like a 50, 50 split. I also think any way that we're wrong on that assumption favors Javante. And there's a few important data points there. One is just, okay. Melvin Gordon was good last year at 28. Now he's 29. Javante was a 21 year old rookie, which is historically a really good class or, or, uh, a cohort of, of backs, the young running back to be in on early in their career, especially going into year two. He was that good at 21. Now he's going into his age two twenty two season. That's when you see a lot of breakouts. So, you know, age working, obviously Javante's favor. Number two, you have a new coaching staff, whole new system, right? So the ways that they did things in 2021 from a running back split might not be the same. Number three, you have the evidence that they did not, make re-signing Melvin Gordon a priority. They let him test the market. It seems like he just couldn't get a multi-year deal or the money he was looking for. They wind up signing him the week of the draft, which I thought was really interesting because if he had other like good offers out there or opportunities, you might want to wait through the draft and see if there's still a team out there that's willing to now say, hey, we didn't get our target in the draft. By that point, you've waited that long. I kind of read that as like maybe Denver's going back to him like, look, take it or leave it. We're going to draft a running back if you don't come back because we need to get a second yeah. running back um yeah because they can't have javante williams carrying the load so they needed to get that second running back one way or another i'm yeah. just kidding i'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. well they had to get they had to get some depth right yeah you but, need depth regardless yeah. that was purely a joke yeah yeah right so anyway i think any of those things could be read into as 2022 could be different than 2021 um i do think i honestly think the most likely scenario was they do still start close to 50 50 early but I think by like week three, week five, if Javante is playing better, that the, the stuff they showed us with their lack of urgency re-signing Melvin and all that, like I think we'll start to lean more towards like a 60-40 than last year. It was like a true 50-50 split last year yeah. with Javante a little more on the receiving side. I think we'll start to lean a little more 60-40, 65-35. I agree with what you're saying, but I've got 60-40. You've got closer to 70-30 here as, as for the whole season. So that's where our discrepancy is. That's or I should say 67. That's that's because I agree with you. It's not what you got on paper, Ben. It's more like it's more like two to one. 67 to yeah. 67 yeah. 33. All right. 67 33. So two thirds Javante Williams. Well, that's the over other, the course of the whole season, though. Like yeah. that's I also but, think but there is there's like huge contingent upside. And I think your point is very valid about let's not forget that Javante Williams, if Melvin Gordon didn't resign, was around one pick. I think that's yeah. a very good point because he still has that upside. Like Melvin Part Gordon. Part of what I'm putting in my projections hurt. as well, and this is just me thumbing the scale because I like Javante, but Melvin Gordon's only played all of the games in a season one time in his seven year career, and now he's 29. Like I think there's more injury risk with the 29 year old back that has missed a game or a couple of games. He's never like missed a ton of time. He's, yeah. he's played at least 12 games in every one of his seasons, but he always misses a couple of games other than his third season. That's the only year of his career that he played the full slate of games um, there. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm kind of thumbing the scale a little and being like, okay, I'm, I'm projecting a, a couple of missed games for Gordon where we do get the full Javante experience a couple of times. Yeah. I think right now where I'm at is Javante is a third round pick. I've got, like Chubb and Fournette a little bit ahead of him right now. And then and then the you know receiver tier of like DJ Moore, AJ Brown. Um 
So it's close. I mean, it's close. I think you probably have him half like, a round ahead earlier than I, I think. Do. So I, yeah, I have um, him in like at least in the second as a pick that I do like making. There's a lot of guys I like in that range, so I don't pick him a ton. Uh, when I was talking about me and Sean did some auction strategy podcast recently over on stealing bananas. And we talked about how he might be an interesting target in auction because you have a different opportunity cost equation. Right. Um, but I, I really, what I was basically saying in terms of us being wrong, uh, projecting this split between him and Gordon sort of all favoring Javante. That's sort of what I, when I start to think about him as like a pretty good anti-fragile pick where like any of the chaos or any of the stuff we might miss on probably favors the 22 year old back that the team was kind of committed to until they brought back Gordon the week of the draft. Um, and I want yeah, to keep that I, in mind. I think that makes complete sense in a vacuum. And just when I'm comparing like the opportunity cost to other players, yeah, you know, like I'm taking Saquon ahead of him, um, who I think has that huge upside and doesn't have the competition to start, you know, doesn't have that question mark. Do you think Melvin's worth drafting as well? I mean, you don't, a lot of times people, I feel like, especially from the outside, the more casual listeners are like, Oh, you like Melvin, but you just said you like Javante and you know, it really comes down to cost. And, so, you know, the contingent value for Melvin, I mean, Javante Williams could also get hurt, which yeah. would boost Melvin Gordon a bunch. So he's interesting to me when you get into, you know, the yeah, mid that's a great point. or so. That's a great point that I just want to hammer home about like sometimes I, I get that a lot too, where it's like, oh, well, you said you were on th this player, so you can't be on his biggest competition. It's like, no, kind of saying like we're identifying this as a spot, this Denver running back spot that could, you know, has upside if the Russ offense like hits, right? They're, if both their prices are solid, maybe we want to attack both in different drafts, right? Like we're just talking about this with Kansas City a little bit too. It's fine to be on multiple guys that are competing with each other. Maybe not the same roster, but... Um, right, yeah, yeah. Maybe not on the same roster, but overall in your portfolio. Good segue into the Denver wide receivers. <laughs> yeah, because, great segue into that. Spoiler alert, tons of upside, but also tons of competition and probably a couple guys that are going to be huge failures. We, I've got... You've got a higher, I've got Judy ahead of Sutton. You have Sutton a little bit ahead of Judy, but like we're splitting hairs a little bit. We've got them pretty close. I have a bit more work for Tim Patrick. You have a bit less, you have a bit more for KJ Hamler, but to reset it, you've got 111 targets on Sutton. I have a hundred on Judy. I have 104. You have 108. Patrick, I have 79. You have 72. Hamler, I have 47. You have 50. Eight, and then we're actually really, really close on the tight end stuff. So we'll save that for the tight ends. And, and we're not sure. really buying into the the talk that this could be, you know, a two tight end system with a ton of tight end targets. Because I know for me, I was like, I'm still going to project this pretty receiver heavy. But there is that possibility. And there's been a discussion that the tight ends yeah. could be a bigger part of the offense as well. Uh, my, yeah. my thoughts on that are uh, the, the the popular thing that I keep seeing is that the gap between Judy and Patrick shouldn't be so large. I'll. Rather than kind of comparing Sutton and Judy, I'll, I, I want to kind of drill in on that where I think Judy is clearly the better pick. Patrick is similar to what I described with Mike Williams before, except for he hasn't made the targets per run jump. He's been between 16 and 17% every year of his career. He, he's had shown some, some efficiency after earning the target. I don't think this guy has that, that next gear. The, the Mike Williams jump was surprising, but also Mike Williams was a former first-round pick that we were kind of waiting to do something like that. Patrick's not a guy that I would think, especially with this much competition, has big target potential. I think he's kind of that ancillary piece that can be efficient yards per target, get you know, have a high touchdown rate season occasionally. I think he did last year, right? Uh, Judy has flashed some um, some real targets per out run upside. So that's the guy that from those two, yeah, I, I was real. I was a little surprised you had Sutton with more targets than Judy, given some of the targets per out run stuff. It felt to me last year. When Judy came back, I mean, Sutton just died. Obviously, different quarterback. You got a quarterback that can hit Sutton down the field a bit more. But Judy, to me, feels like the guy that if someone were to pull away ahead in targets and just earned a shitload, that it would be him and not Sutton. Yeah, that is just totally a feel thing on mm -hmm. watching Wilson for, for so long and feeling like Sutton. And that's what the market, I think. Or I, I mean, I've certainly heard this. It's not like a, you know, a strong take or anything, but Sutton's more of a better fit for what Russ does, the way Judy runs his routes. Russ has never really had a high volume receiver like Judy. He's had a lot that resembles Sutton and Sutton might even be better than, than some of the ones that have done well. I mean, you could argue, I guess, Judy's similar to Doug Baldwin. Um, but I don't know. I think, I think of what, 
I, th- I just feel like Judy would really thrive with like a timing QB, like a Tom Brady or something, right? Whereas Sutton mm-hmm. is more vertical, big play guy, going to be on the receiving end of those, you know, big Russ bombs. The extended plays are going to benefit him. Russ showed an affinity for, for putting up some balls to DK Metcalf and just being like, you know, go get him. Sutton's that more physically imposing receiver than Judy. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's just a feel thing with Russ. I, I like them both, though. I do want to have some exposure to Judy. Yeah, the sudden thing has gained steam. I know early in the offseason, we were way ahead on both. We were pretty early on the Denver situation. And then a combination of we cooled a little bit on Judy Sutton just because Tim Patrick's a thorn that's there. And we like felt like we weren't accounting for it as much. Like We just had to give him some more targets to be realistic. Um, but the ADPs also, particularly on Sutton, really ramped up. Uh, sudden on underdog right now, wide receiver 17, Judy wide receiver 23. We have Judy wide receiver 22 and sudden wide receiver 23. Um, that's pre me bumping the pass rate a little bit though. So those guys will get moved up some post bumping the pass rate. I, I guess my broad take on them is I, I can't really, I mean, in a projection, number one, one of my notes is it's impossible to get enough targets spread around for what these guys profiles are. I'm a little bit yeah. higher on Hamler. I wanted, you know, I kind of, I, I like him as a rotational fourth receiver that I still think has some some upside in, in his profile. And just because I wanted to get him a few targets, probably that that comes at the expense of, you know, some of, of Patrick and Judy. It comes at the expense of the tight ends. Like there's just no way in a projection to to get it all to add up with this many guys that have intriguing profiles. Um, but I was going to say, I don't really have like a I, – I can totally see being higher on Judy, basically. I don't like have like yeah. a real strong – yeah, I think it's a situation where one of these guys is probably going to do really, really well, and perhaps when you're your league, and you should be targeting both of them at you know around ADP or so, and in some cases just taking the cheaper one and being okay and if you miss with them both, and maybe take the swing. Yeah, if you want Patrick, for me, it's like I would rather have Hamler even later than Patrick. But if you want Patrick, or if you want one of the tight ends, and you can get Dulcich so late, and I think he's a worthy late flyer and tight end premium. Uh, Alberto maybe a little too pricey right now with some of the reporting on Dulcich, but yeah, like I, I agree with what you said about trying to get one of them, but if you don't get either, maybe still target this passing game in the late rounds, right? Like get a piece of it. I do feel like this Hamler stuff got out of control at a certain point this off season for a guy with 455 career receiving yards. Super sad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but his, his ADP set a little bit more. I think he's like a, a very late round pick and sometimes he goes more like, you know, early mid teens. I think he's kind of like very back end of the draft type guy. Yeah. But as far as gambles on tight end, so tight end, I want to talk to you about because there's a lot of you know the off season camp news. Like you know, Dalsich is more of a pure wide receiver. Is he going to cut into Albert O's work? Some people are saying maybe Dalsich is like in line with Albert O. We have it right now with Albert O at about a nice 69 targets and Dolchitz at about 41 targets. We're very similar in how we have that broken down. How do you feel about this? Because Albert O is again, very intriguing, much like the receivers in the sense that you can see this going really right. When you look at the potential for more opportunity, a better quarterback, and then his efficiency, just his yards per out run has been absurd. But then if he ends up, if you end up taking like a tight end 14, who splits time, yeah. With it, it's like, well, that was bad. <laughs> yeah. He's big. He's super fast. He's like, he's a really athletic tight end. He's only run 223 routes in two years, but he's earned a target on 26% of them. That's like a huge number for a tight end. I mean, that's like really good for a wide receiver. And, and the tight end scale is a little bit shifted down. If you look at it from yards per out run, he was 2.28 as a rookie on only 53 routes. And then he was 1.94. That two plateau is really impressive he's basically right there both years again small route samples if he runs more hard to continue to hit that but like you said like it's intriguing obviously that there's this possibility that he could run more routes and has already flashed like this with his athleticism his size speed combo and now he might play with russ wilson and um the whole the whole package from from his like player perspective is intriguing it looks like a a potential breakout tight end that could be a future top five top three tight end if he's like able to translate this really small sample into something larger um but the reports are that you know number one they went got dulcich who shout out our boy pat corain has has been all over all offseason loves him 
the reports are that they really like Dulcich and he might play a lot. They're kind of different tight ends too. Okugman, I'm a little bit more of an inline guy. Dulcich, a little bit more of a stand up outside tight end. I, it's like, it's so hard to read. But right now, with just the like, this is one where I really want to pay attention to camp news. The latest stuff mm-hmm. has Absolutely. me a little scared off Alberto and interested in Dulcich really late because it's it's been a little more favorable for Dulcich. If I'm in a redraft league in particular, I kind of don't care about this Albert O Dulcich noise right now. Like I'm, I'm drafting Albert O because I think this ceiling is really, really good. And if it doesn't happen, I mean, tight end is like at a certain point, you know, like Evan Ingram might be on waivers in your league, you know, yeah. like, like, uh, so in, in this, again, standard redraft managed league. Now you get in the leagues with deeper benches. You might have to be a little bit more thoughtful with your picks and best ball, you know, but it just, it seems hard for, for Albert O to be bad. Like even if they split time, I think he's going to be like, okay, just because the offense should produce. Yeah, we talked about how Russ's targets score. tend to be really efficient. He was already really efficient with Drew Lockett and Teddy Bridgewater quarterback. Yeah. And then Dalsich seems like a, a, you know, a good, I've taken him and McBride. I take a lot as my tight end three on underdog. And we've, we've hit on that with the NFC West stuff, but Taking an upside rookie as your tight end three on a team that you know needs three tight ends, I think makes more sense than taking, you know, some some scrub just because he's like first on the death chart. Austin, quote Hunter. unquote. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's the guy you're you're thinking of, but that's the Cooper. Game. <laughs> I mean, there, there's some of the indie guys go sometimes, or like Bre- I I don't Brevin Jordan, someone I, I kind of want to get your. T- I haven't been in on Brevin Jordan, but he's. A lot of times it comes down to like, am I going to take Brevin Jordan or one of these rookies um, if I'm that third tight end spot? Yeah, I think you can go either way. I, I, Brevin Jordan, pretty good profile and had a decent rookie year. So you can make a breakout case for him. Let's go to the Raiders. This is one where we do have some play calling discrepancies. I have about a play more per game than Ben does. And I also have the Raiders at a 63% pass rate. Ben has 61.5%. I think you know Derek Carr is the type of quarterback that you're going to use with like a higher pass volume offense. Maybe not necessarily a huge A dot, even though he did make some improvements there. But another new coaching situation, um, and the play discrepancy is basically like Ben has them slightly below average, and I have them slightly above average. It's not like massive, but it is a one play per game difference. I thought I had them for for sort of my targets slightly above. But I was what I was targeting for my average. Yeah, I think I, the pace has just come up recently. So, okay. I um, I basically no, you do. Like, no, I, pretty, I, I. Sorry, go ahead. You do. You you kind of have them right in line with the average, I guess I should say. Yeah. And then in my notes, I was like, I I don't really know. There's going to probably be some AFC West shootouts. I'm going to make them slightly fast paced, slightly pass heavy. Probably not really accounting for the fact that with Denver, Kansas City, and LA LA in their division. It, it, I probably need to be more than slightly. I, I like your numbers more than mine. I'm going to bring this up. Yeah, I think I, I, the plays is a little bit more of a crapshoot. Maybe it makes more sense to be closer in line, but I do like the high pass rate given what they did last year. I think Mc, you know McDaniel is going to have a higher pass rate. And yeah, they're they're fourth in this division. Uh, so even though they're a good offense, they're you know not going to be in the best of the game scripts mostly. Like Even if they win some of these games in the division, the game script isn't going to be it's not like they're going to be winning by like two touchdowns against the Chiefs, most likely. Yeah. So Carr for me is kind of in no man's land for your typical redraft manage, where I really just would prefer a different quarterback. I think in best ball, he's kind of fine as a QB two. He's not your. I don't really want him as my QB one, but I've been higher on the pass catchers in the market. So there have been some stack opportunities for me there. We both have him around 320 fantasy points, around 30 passing touchdowns, 4,700 yards, completing a really high percentage of his passes. Not sure there's too much more to add there other than uh, yeah, I thought just, Derek Carr was pretty bad. And it turns out he's like a he's pretty solid he's quarterback. Pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's some later quarterbacks that I think that come out close in my projections that, that I think are cheap, like basically what you said. They're they're cheaper and, and have some upside. He didn't come out particularly great. Anytime we're close, again, my projections are sort of like a 60th percentile outcome, probably. Uh, anytime we're close, that means that that in my ranks or my my overall projections, the player's probably down from, from ADP a little bit. 
Uh, and that's the case with Carr. I don't know that I, he's a big target for me at his price. Josh Jacobs, we each have right around 172 fantasy points. Very similar makeup. We're just over 200 carries, around 40 targets for him. He, to me, is... If he's going in home leagues in round five or so, that's your your prototypical dead zone running back. He's kind of the archetype that we tend to avoid in that range. In some of the sharper leagues, I have sort of fallen on the grenade in like round seven where I'm like, okay, you know, he did catch passes last year. Fifth in he's, among NFL backs and catches last year. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, he did catch passes. I think the offense is going to be decent, so he should score some. Like, you know, like six, seven turn, I think Jacobs is okay, uh, even though, and he was profitable last year as a best ball investment because it was kind of the same dynamic. Like no one really wanted to draft him and he just sort of stayed alive. Now that's like almost verbatim the red flag, which is like, he stayed alive and he did pretty good and he still wasn't amazing because there wasn't the huge ceiling. But at a certain point, the cost becomes okay on a guy like that and to, for me it's like the six seven turn it's definitely not round five so and the other thing i would add because i agree with everything you said is he did catch 54 balls which seemed like the part of his profile that couldn't Good be board. there and then it was he was fifth in the nfl among backs in, in receptions one of only seven who caught 50 plus balls and yet like you said there wasn't really a, a huge ceiling and and my concern is they're talking about this situational committee in the backfield mcdaniel coming over from uh new england where they've always had a passing downs back they bring over bolden who they used in that role in new england last year when james white went down they also have amir abdullah on the roster who has played that type of a role in different offenses even Kenyon drake has has played sort of a not as much as maybe his college profile would have suggested but it, it can play on passing downs a little and, and he, he hasn't played it a ton in these later years of his career but early on a little bit um i I, I end up with even – you've taken his targets way down from last year. I wind up, wind up with even fewer. Even though that was like such an it's, exciting thing for him last year, I do feel like with the situational stuff they're talking about, that's where he loses work, right? He becomes Damian Harris, yeah. right? He He's the type of guy I like to project very conservatively. I do think it's a good exercise, though, to be like – to kind of find a stopping point, which is, hey, you know, we're projecting less targets than catches he had last year. Um which I think is the correct way to project it, or I wouldn't, and you wouldn't be doing that. But it is kind of like, okay, if he spits out for me, you know, end around six with this pretty conservative projection, like maybe that's okay then, I guess is yeah. kind of where I'm at. But I, yeah, I agree. I'm a little concerned. You know, they draft Zimir White. I'm concerned he has a threat to the two down work. You know, I'm concerned, you know, they got Kenyon Drake and Brandon Bolden. If those guys are a threat to pass down work, Again, new coach too, so maybe they don't view Jacobs as the pass catcher. I do see a lot that can go wrong with Jacobs. To me, he's going to be the prototypical overdrafted in home leagues and probably somewhat fair in some of the sharper type formats. Yeah, Especially like, 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 and I like him in basketball too because I'm more open to the boring season, boring running back seasons yeah. in basketball. Where I'm just like, okay, well, it's a running back. I don't have to draft later and just like, like get me my 12 points a week and, and that spot's filled. <laughs> kind of, whereas in, in redraft, like manage, you, you're looking for a bit more juice in that. Right. And manage is a dead zone back. And, and it's a dead zone back because the opportunity cost is a potential breakout wide receiver, right? But when you're talking about the really sharp leagues you've been in where the equation gets changed, more receivers are going in that. And, and, in, in those fourth, fifth, sixth rounds and the running backs are getting pushed down. And so now the opportunity causes a different class of receiver. I can see making that, that pick at that point. But like you said, in home leagues where you would have to take him in a managed league, the upside's just not going to be there compared to the, the alternatives, whether it's another receiver or even just grabbing your, your upside QB at that point. Right. Like I'd rather take Kyler mm -hmm. or Lamar. And oh yeah. Quarterback. And late on running sure. back. Yeah. Now, you would think Ben and I cheated off each other looking at the target projections here because we're just eerily in lockstep for a team that has... A little bit, because you made a compelling case to me earlier in the offseason that you thought this was going to be a pretty concentrated 3 oh, yeah. show. And I, I was thinking about that a little bit when I was doing my yeah. projection. I was like, I think we're well, right about that. Actually, I guess real quick, I really haven't been drafting too many contingent backs for the Raiders because I'm worried Zimir White's purely a two-down contingent back and Drake's like purely a pass-catching contingent back. I just don't see a ton of upside for either of those guys. So I, I haven't been drafting any of them. Do you have any takes on the 
I have backup Justin either. I, I think it's going to be a, a kind of a cluster. I, you know, I think like yeah. Drake's price is fine. He's probably like if they do use a lot of situational backs, that he can beat that. But I also don't know what the upside is. Even if Jacobs goes down, they're probably still going to have a rotation like New England. They've kind of told us that already. If I'm right about Bolden or Amir Abdullah having a pass catching role, it's just gross. So Devontae Adams, I have 147 targets. Ben has 149. Hunter Renfro, I have 106. Ben has 108. Demarcus Robinson, we're both around 30. Keelan Cole, we're both around 30. Darren Waller, I have 118. Ben has 119. So we're, I mean, we're really, really close. <laughs> I have found myself, I thought going into the year that I would be lower than the market on Devontae Adams. I have found that not to be the case. I'm actually pretty excited for Devontae Adams. This switch from Rodgers to anyone is obviously not good because they had a pretty unique relationship, particularly by the goal line in terms of touchdowns. And you aren't going to get the absurd target share in base that you got with Green Bay just because you've got a lot more competition and there's a little bit more threat. I do think, though, Devontae Adams, like still maybe talent of his peak years, but I don't think he's out of them yet. He's just, he's really freaking good. He's playing with a super accurate quarterback. And a lot of this stuff, Ben, that I'm worried about losing Rodgers is sort of just made up for, and this team's going to throw the ball, you know, a lot more than Green Bay is. Green Bay ran at a slow pace last year. Their PROE was fine, but they, they dominated. So the game script just didn't really dictate too many pass attempts the last couple of seasons. And they, the, uh, you know, the Adams car college thing, they played together. Adams was a star in college. Had a massive hashtag shower narrative. Out. Hashtag shower narrative. Um, I, I was right where you were at. I, I thought I was going to wind up kind of out on Adams because of the, the, the change and the sort of preternatural connection that he had with Rogers and, and yet, like he's clearly the wide receiver five in my projections, and and I, I was I like Adams more than Diggs. Maybe that's a you know weird coming from a, a Bills homer, but I I do like Adams. I prefer Adams to Diggs. Now, I like Diggs, so that's a difference. Our consensus ranks, you know, we're, I'm working on the back end with a group of people, and we're also incorporating Silva's top 150. Silva's more worried on Adams than me. We have Diggs ahead of Adams in our team rankings but personally I, I prefer adams two digs and one thing i do like to always keep in my back pocket is no we're not going to project a 33 percent base target share for Devonte adams in this offense in fact i think i'm around 25 percent, which feels really fair yeah, someone gets enough. hurt that's not adams the 33 percent comes back and now we're talking 33 percent and a team that throws more you know, the upside's really compelling to me and um, I'm probably just overly bullish on Gabe Davis, which scares me on Diggs just a hair. But what the Yeah. I, I mean, I think he's put all that well. I, I have Diggs slightly higher, but that's more of a Diggs conversation. I uh, you're right on Adams, though. I have about 25% target share, and there is still contingent upside. I like that. Yeah, Renfro, I was drafting for a while. It seemed like the ADP's gotten a little bit hotter on him. Uh, I don't know. I think he's fine. Again, like... Like, I mean, when you've got this, th these three guys, when you've got Adams run for a Waller, I think you've got a good setup where it's so con it's concentrated enough that all three have base value. And then they all have the upside if one of the other ones gets hurt. Uh, so Renfro seems like, okay, at wide receiver 40, so I don't really have any sort of take there. I kind of don't like him where he's going. I think he's good. Um, I feel like him and Waller have cannibalized each other a little bit just on a weekly level. I don't have any great stats to reference, uh, but when they're both in the lineup, it's not necessarily amazing. Uh, so I don't really like, I, I feel like Adams is the one that is doing different stuff, but, but Wall Waller, Waller has the ability to be a little bit more of a vertical tight end, but like they're sort of competing for those shallow targets to a degree. Yeah. And Renfro you know, going to have one of your bigger discrepancies between full and half PPR because his game is going to be predicated on, you know, a pretty high catch rate, not big plays at all. So Another we're just... I have on him here is he was especially good in the red zone last year with those, you know, triple moves and everything everyone was talking about. You mentioned 
how big that's been to Adams' profile, and noted that's potentially some some risk to Adams, where he could lose some of his otherworldliness in his profile if Renfro is still a guy that Carr is looking at in those spots. Yeah, and we both have Adams for right around nine touchdowns. He has scored 11 and 18 the past two seasons uh, with missing a couple games in there. He scored five in 2019 where he missed a few games. And then he was double digits all three seasons prior. So I feel like we're doing a good job sort of baking that risk yeah. in. Um, and that's what the other surprise. So we, we both have Renfro right around five to six. Would it surprise you if Renfro had eight and Adams had six? I think that would surprise me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd be surprised. I mean, of course, that's not, that's like definitely within, you know, the range of outcomes, but I'd be, I'd be surprised. A uh, Waller. So Waller, I've been in on, um, you know, boring Mike has Waller a little bit ahead of Pitts, <laughs> at least in, the, <laughs> at least in the, the full PPR. At stuff. least you preface that with boring Mike. There's, I could um, never do that. I could never put on enough condoms to do that. On on underdog, uh, we've got pits ahead, but in the the full PPR stuff, I, just, I think Waller is going to rack up so many catches. Have a pretty really high catch rate. I feel good about Waller. Honestly, I think this offense is going to be decent. They're going to have to throw a lot. Uh, I do get where it's a five condom play because Kyle Pitts is yeah. the you know, best tight end prospect we've had in a long time. Like, I can't probably. wait to talk about Pitts now, but uh, you're right about Waller. He's fine. Like he's definitely one of the last of the, you know, potential ceiling tight ends. He's somebody that I'm definitely willing to take some swings on. I took him in a Scott Fishbowl as my tight end. I wasn't like thrilled about the pick, but you know, it is what it is. He's, you kind of got to take him if you yeah. didn't get one of the top three tight ends and you're in a spot to take him because there's not a lot of tight end upside staring staring at you after him and Kittle come off the board. Any concerns for you with this offense not having, at least as their primary guys, any sort of field stretcher? Like, there's not a ton of speed, I guess. Um, Keelan in, Cole's in the base. pretty fast. I think that's why I think yeah. Keelan Cole probably wins the number three job. I mean, Demarcus Robinson mm -hmm. is always not great in Kansas City. We talked about that in the Kansas City section. He's like the one guy who couldn't be efficient with with Mahomes or as efficient um, is supposedly a good blocker, but I I've kind of liked Keelan Cole to win that number three job because he provides a little bit more of a speed element. It is kind of a concern. Yeah. If he's, if, if Keelan Cole's not there and there's no one there to, to provide that. Um, I mean, Adams might have to be a little bit more of the vertical guy and then have Renfro and Waller sort of underneath or, or run Waller downfield more. They did that early last year a little bit. I remember like, I think it was week one. They just threw downfield to Waller a ton. He had a ton of air yards. And then they yeah. kind of didn't do that again. But yeah, that's, uh, I feel like if I'm wrong on the Raiders, that's where it goes wrong is that stuff's kind of like a little too congested and they're not able to be as successful as I thought they were overall. Um, I don't think it's a huge concern, but it's, a little bit of an unknown with, you know, kind of three guys that you figure to, you know, just rack up catches. And I don't even want to say short a dot, but like short to medium a dot, not long a dot areas. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, Adams doesn't have, he's slightly below average from an a dot perspective compared to most number one receivers. Renfro obviously is below average. Uh, Waller is, you know, he's above average for a tight end Waller, but still like tight end a dots are a lot lower. I mean, they're all, yeah. They're all in that shallower range for sure. All right. That's going to do it for us in the AFC West version. Uh, we will be back. As I said, we're trying to pump these out around one a day and get them finished by the end of July. I'm not sure what division we have up next. Uh, ben, what, what do we got next? We're going north next based on what I've, what I've actually north. gotten through. <laughs> all right. That works. AFC North, we'll say, yes. is next, which will be exciting because we get to talk about Lamar Jackson. So I'm excited for that. Someone I'm really high on. Make sure you follow Ben, bengretch.substack.com. Also tune in to his podcast with Sean Siegel, Stealing Bananas. The podcast you are listening to right now is Establish the Ads. You can find it on the iTunes podcast feed. Like, subscribe. That helps a lot. Also like and subscribe to the Establish the Run YouTube channel. And thank you so much for listening. Best of luck this season.